These were so bad that some of them had entire laws created to prevent them from happening ever again. Let's dive into number nine. The Stanford Prison Experiment. It's 1971. A psychology professor named Philip Zimbardo had a simple question. If you put normal college students in a fake prison, what happens? He figured he'd get some interesting data about human nature. Instead, he accidentally created a torture chamber in the Stanford University basement. He recruits 24 college students, flips a coin. Heads, you're a guard. Tails, you're a prisoner. That's it. Random assignment. But by day three, something twisted was going on. The guards started getting cruel. Not just mean, actually sadistic. They made prisoners do push-ups at midnight, forced them to clean toilets with their bare hands, made them chant humiliating songs. But that's when things got really dark. One prisoner just broke completely. He started screaming uncontrollably, crying, having what looked like a mental breakdown right there in the cell. His thoughts scattered, his words incoherent. The guards thought he was faking it. So they offered him a deal. Become an informant. Tell us what the other prisoners are planning. Do that, and we'll go easier on you. The prisoner said yes, but when he told the other prisoners they couldn't actually leave, everything collapsed. The other prisoners got so depressed, so disoriented, that they couldn't function. They just sat there, catatonic almost. Zimbardo had planned this to run for two weeks, but on day six, a graduate student watching the experiment pulled him aside and said, this is abuse, you have to stop this. Zimbardo finally shut it down. The trauma? Real, documented enough to force Congress to pass new laws making sure psychology experiments couldn't abuse people like this ever again. But that was just the beginning. What came next was somehow even more shocking. <sighs> Number eight, Milgram's obedience experiments. Yale University, early 1960s. Stanley Milgram had a burning question that everyone was asking back then. After World War II, how did ordinary Germans participate in the Holocaust? Were they evil? Or would anyone do it if an authority figure told them to? So Milgram designed an experiment to find out. He told participants they were testing how punishment affected learning. Simple, right? Wrong. Here's the setup. Two people. One's a teacher, one's a learner. A teacher sits in front of a control panel. It has switches. Each switch delivers an electric shock, starting at 15 volts, going up to 450 volts. The learner sits in another room strapped to an electric chair. The game starts. The learner answers questions. When they get one wrong, the teacher delivers a shock. With each wrong answer, the voltage increases. 15 volts, nothing. 30 volts, still nothing. 60 volts, the learner starts yelling, this hurts, stop. 90 volts, they're screaming. 150 volts, they're begging to stop. At this point, the participant, the teacher, gets nervous. They look at the experimenter and ask, should I stop? The experimenter says four words, you have no choice, continue. And they do. They press the button, the learner screams louder, blood-curdling screams, demanding release, absolutely panicked. But the experimenter keeps saying it, you must continue. 250 volts, 300 volts, the machine goes completely silent. Not screaming anymore, just quiet. Dead silence. Some participants ask, did I kill him? The experimenter responds, the experiment requires that you continue. And they do. 375 volts, 450 volts, the maximum. The machine is labeled danger, severe shock, but 65% of participants went all the way to the end, all the way. Here's what happened afterward. The participants were visibly destroyed, shaping, sweating. Some had nervous laughter, the kind of laugh that means someone's losing their mind. When the experimenter finally revealed the learner had never actually been shocked that it was an actor the whole time, many participants had a moment of pure relief. But still, it disoriented them. Years later, a participant told researchers, I will never forget what happened here. Never. Number seven, the Little Albert experiment. It's 1920. John Watson was a famous psychologist obsessed with one question. Is fear something you're born with or is it something people teach you? So he found a nine month old baby named Albert and he decided to find out. First, Watson introduced Albert to a small white rat. No reaction, Albert didn't care about the rat. He played with it, normal baby stuff. 
Then Watson started the real experiment. Every single time they showed Albert the rat, Watson would make a loud clanging noise right behind the baby's head. Not just once, over and over. Clang, right behind him. The baby would scream, cry, terror on his face. They'd wait a day, try it again. Clang, more screaming. After weeks of this, something happened. They showed Albert the rat. No clanging noise this time, but Albert screamed. Anyway, the fear had transferred. The baby wasn't afraid of the noise anymore. He was afraid of the rat. But then things got even weirder when Albert started being afraid of everything fluffy. Dogs, rabbits, cotton wool, anything soft and small triggered the same terror response. His fear had generalized. One sound plus one animal equals terror of anything resembling it. But then the experiment ended. Nobody did anything to fix it. No therapy, no systematic desensitization. Watson just left. Albert grew up with a documented lifelong fear of animals. Years later, people who knew Albert would say his family would tease him about it at dinner. Hey, Albert, watch out for Fluffy. He couldn't have dogs visit his house. He had to ask guests to keep their pets in separate rooms. His entire life shaped by one scientist's curiosity. The worst part? Albert never knew he was in an experiment. He lived decades not understanding why he was terrified of something most people find completely harmless. He had no explanation, no context, just trauma with no source. So he couldn't even process it. But trauma from ignorance is one thing. What happened next involved deliberate deception on an incomprehensible scale. Number six, the Tuskegee syphilis study, 1932, rural Alabama. The U.S. Public Health Service shows up at churches in poor black communities with an amazing offer. Free medical care, free meals, burial instruments, just participate in a study about a disease called bad blood. Nearly 400 men sign up. What they weren't told, they didn't have bad blood. They had syphilis. But the study's actual purpose was to watch them die from it untreated so researchers could perform autopsies and study what happens when syphilis destroys a human body. That's not medicine. That's not research. That's weaponized deception. For years, nothing happened. The men got treatment, which was actually just placebos, fake medicine, then, in 1945, something changed. Penicillin became available. It was a cure, a real effective cure for syphilis. But the researchers didn't tell them. They kept showing up, kept telling them, and you're getting treatment, you're in good hands, continue with the study. But they weren't giving them any penicillin. They were actively preventing the men from accessing the one thing that could save their lives. The study actually continued for 40 years, four decades. By the time a journalist finally exposed it in 1972, at least 28 men had died directly from syphilis. Around another 100 died from complications. 40 of the men's wives got infected. 19 children were born with congenital syphilis, damage from birth that would affect their lives. But the psychological trauma didn't stop with the men who died. It created something far more damaging, mistrust because the government deliberately poisoned 400 men and watched them suffer while a cure existed. An official presidential apology didn't come until 1997, 65 years after the study started. The surviving ones got a settlement, money, but the damage was permanent. That experiment should have been the wake-up call. But scientists kept pushing. 